Uh, we have a very distinguished group of panelists that we're going to have a panel discussion over the next 45 minutes to share some insight and the research and work that they're doing. But first, before we get started, uh, let me give you some background on our panelists so that you understand uh, the work and their roles in their current organizations. Uh, first, starting here with uh, Laurent Champenet, holds a PhD in mechanical engineering from the École Normale Supérieure Paris Saclay. Uh, he, in 2012, became the vice president in charge of education at the École Nationale Supérieure des Arts Médées, and most recently, in 2017, became president of the organization. Welcome and thank you. Uh, sitting next to Professor Champenet is Professor Jun Li, who is a, a doctoral supervisor and vice president of Tsinghua University. He was elected as a distinguished professor of the Shantian Scholars Program of the Ministry of Education in 2014 and served as the Dean of Industrial Engineering Department at Tsinghua University. Today, he serves as a Secretary General for the National Education Guidance Committee for the Postgraduate Engineering Management Professor Degree, a member of the Industrial Engineering Teaching Guidance Committee of the Ministry of Education. Welcome, thank you. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Mike Greaves, a uh, well-renowned author and expert on product life cycle management, writing some of the first books and publications and benchmarks on the subjects. Uh, it's no secret that he influenced what we call now the digital twin uh, back in 2002. In addition to that, he's worked very closely with the additive manufacturing with the Society of Manufacturing Engineers to create an independent technical evaluation of additive manufacturing, also called ITEAM. He has 45 years experience working in industry, including uh, taking a systems integration company public. And today, he is the executive director of the Center of Advanced Manufacturing and Innovative Design at the Florida Institute of Technology. So gentlemen, thank you for coming and, you. and welcome to the panel discussion. So why don't we jump into it? Uh, let's first talk about some of the trends. So uh, Dr. Grease, we'll start with you. We talk and look at the trends that are impacting companies today based upon your experience in working with industry, uh, your research at the university. Maybe you can shed some light on which of these trends are actually having an impact on the organizations and companies that we're seeing today. Thanks, Eric. So, so you certainly mentioned the digital twin, and really what that concept is about is moving from the physical into the virtual area. And so, so it's sort of the, because um, it's much cheaper and much faster to move around bits than it is to atoms, and we'll continue to get to do so. What we really want to do is move from the physical ways we've been doing things to basically, so my ideal for this is we want to create the product virtually, we want to test the product virtually, we want to manufacture the product virtually, and we want to support the product virtually, and only when we get it all right do we want to actually go out and move around expensive atoms. And so, so the focus there is, is to basically be able to, to move as much stuff into virtualization because we can do it much faster and much cheaper. The, the, the absolute ideal there and, and the thing that I'm the most interested in at the moment is basically additive manufacturing or 3D printing because what we'd really like to do instead of, instead of the manufacturing we've done in the past is actually print it because we can basically create brand new products that we've never seen before and, and uh, I think uh, uh, really revolutionize the product area. So that's sort of the, the, the big thing we've seen. That means that we're basically going to, to extend the enterprise you know, into the supply chain, also to basically um, not simply uh, have silos, but basically integrate engineering with manufacturing and even mm. with support. Okay. Professor Jun, yeah. what's your perspective? <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, um, I have different viewpoints. I think uh, in the different level, we maybe we have different trends. In the workstation level, I think maybe the digital workers are the major uh, trends. Although we think the automation is um, everywhere, but we still need uh, worker work in the workspace. So I think we can use the information technology to improve the work efficiency and improve the quality of working life. In the factory level, I think uh, the, the data-driven manufacturing or data-driven smart manufacturing is a major chance. 
uh, we have um, so powerful computing capability. We have uh, so many data, so many, so many sense. So the transparency is, uh, is dramatically improved. So we can use this data to improve the factory dramatically. Then in the industrial level, I think that uh, the manufacturing paradigm will change. Um, uh, you know, in the early 90s, we have the, the mass production as a major uh, uh, manufacturing paradigm. But uh, in 1960, we have lean manufacturing as a major paradigm. But now we have so many new technology. I think maybe in the future, we have a new paradigm will change, will shape the whole industry. One I think is very important is the distributed manufacturing. I think it's the major chance. Thank you. Professor Champenet, your perspective. Uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, for me, one key point is the, the, the continuity of the digital chain. As we saw earlier on, on, on this platform, uh, data is everywhere. Every, everyone is concerned by data, and protecting it is, is a major issue for, for the companies. And the second thing is uh, we have, as we saw, we have many new ways of communication inside the company and between the company. And that's a major change in, in the company and also in the society. And we have to train people for that. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, Professor Jun, let's come back to your comment on lean. We talk about the opportunities that technology provides. Yeah. Uh, and there's a big discussion about digitization. How do you see the impact of digitization with lean? OK. Um, I think uh, w uh, there's a two way. One, we call them the evolution way. S uh, in the revolution way, maybe the digital lane is a new uh, concept because we can, you know, you know, the lane is very popular concept and widely uh, implemented in, the, in, the, in the lots of different uh, industry. So by using digital tools, information technology, we really can improve the power of the lane. So this okay. we call the digital lane. Uh, we, we have them trained there <laughs> in, yeah. in the morning, I watch that. Yeah. And another, I think, is um, uh, still the data-driven uh, the, the smart manufacturing. I, I think it's more revolutionary way. You know, we have so many, uh, uh, you know, the, the information, so many data, and we have so many compu computing capability. So, Maybe in the old day, we only can solve the equation for 10 million variables, but now we have a much more powerful. So we can treat off more, you know, not only one factory, maybe we can uh, optimize the whole production network. So by using this kind of uh, computing capability, we can realize the data-driven smart manufacturing to really optimize not only the factory, but also the production network. Yeah, so we talk about lean in that construct. Uh, let's talk about some of the new technologies and advancements yeah. that we're seeing and the impact on organizations, whether it's augmented reality or virtual reality or the Internet of Things or even other technologies that we may not even have exposure to that you're doing research on. Maybe you could shed some light on, on what some of those technologies and trends are as they potentially impact manufacturers. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, we have uh, so many uh, uh, technology will impact uh, the, the manufacturing. I think uh, the two category, one is the manufacturing process, like the 3D uh, printing is, uh, you know, they will change lots of things. And another is information technology. It's really will change the, the whole industry, manufacturing industry, yeah. yeah. Professor Champenet, what do you see? Yeah, for me, uh, augmented reality is really a revolution. We saw some fantastic example uh, this morning, and uh, we are able to bring information to the workers, on any workers, and uh, all types of information on real time. And uh, we now talk about augmented workers with uh, augmented reality systems, uh, uh, cameras, microphone, and this leads to uh, ethical issues in a company because you can survey the workers every day. And that's a, a major problem in the company and uh, uh, human groups in the company would have to be very strong to go through this augmented reality revolution. Okay, very interesting. Professor Jun, I want to come back to Lean just for one moment. 
we talk about digitization. Is digitization and digitalization by itself enough as companies look to move forward and using it in the construct of like lean, like you just described? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, from my, my viewpoint, uh, you know, it's uh, related to the, uh, the technology. It's not our objective. You know, you're like, we say uh, we use that some technology, we use the new technology, but we try to, uh, to ar arrive our business uh, objective. For example, we say we use the uh, automation to improve the productivity or improve the quality or, or the reduce the, the cost, but we, we, cannot, uh, we cannot just use the technology as a showcase. So from my viewpoint, uh, the most important thing is uh, we need to know why we use the technology. If we know our objective, then we can use our technology effectively. By using this way, we really can successfully use the, the new technology. Lean is uh, it actually is a, it's a very wide, uh, it's a very wide uh, uh, concept which is used in every, almost in every industry. The lean means it's really give you efficiency. So it's a, a business objective, it's not the technology objective. So we can use the technology to improve the link to the another new end. So I think it's, it's not so conflict. It's uh, really can use the new technology to get the, the, even the linear. So this is my viewpoint. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I, I think it yeah. really comes down to tying the technology to a business outcome. Yeah. And that really takes us to the next set of topics is we're talking about technology and trends, but at the end of the day, it comes down to how manufacturers and companies can embrace and transform. So let's talk about how these companies want to stay ahead of the game, right? So for you, uh, Dr. Greaves, what are some of the key factors that companies need to look at going beyond the current digitization and looking at how they transform and what steps do you suggest that manufacturers take? So, so I drive everything from use cases. So, so again, it goes back to this value proposition of why I'm using information. And, and remember, you know, what people sort of don't understand is that, that the value of information is being able to replace wasted resources uh, with information. So if I take any task, I can divide it up into two parts. I can divide it up into lean, which is the most effective, efficient way I can do it, and then everything else that basically we add on. So I take information. I can't replace it with the physical resources. I actually need to do the task. People see, still need to move things around. Machines need to cut metal, things like that. But I can use information for the wasted resources. And so my focus on there is to, is to basically do that. And you need to do it across the enterprise. So, so the, my problem with a lot of what we've done you know, historically is we basically optimized in areas, engineering, manufacturing, uh, mm -hmm. poor support never gets optimized. But um, the focus there is, is we've sub-optimized across the entire organization. And so we really need to use this information you know, in terms of doing that. One of my fond things of saying is, if I design something that can't be manufactured, I've just made pretty pictures. And so I really want to make, make sure that I can, you know, when I'm designing, I'm basically working on the manufacturability, the supportability, even the disposability of the product. And so, so that's what we really want to, to to enable here with engineering. So if I, can, if I could, could ideally replace all information with the waste of resources, that's as lean as you're ever going to be because it's not only about efficiency, it's about effectiveness. That makes sense. Professor Jung, what recommendations would you have? Um, yeah, I think the, maybe I take for example, yeah, you know, university and we always complain for our information system. So the professor always complains, so information system is so poor. <laughs> and we, every time the head of the information system always, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, really uh, painful mm -hmm. when we have a meeting and we cannot solve the problem. Every time we complain, yes. And from last year, our president say, okay, uh, president want to lead the project. So we have to change the information system because it's not like a modern university current system, information system. So I think the transformation is not only the technology. It's not only you buy the software, you, you buy the hardware, and you install in the workshop. It's more related to the people. 
So you have trained the people, you have changed your mindsets, you have changed the way you, you work. So it's, we call them the transformation. Yeah. So it's not that say you just buy something. You cannot say you buy the software, then you can improve your performance. You buy the software, this is the first step. Then you, you invest lots of your time, your efforts, your leadership, then you can get successful. Okay. And Professor Champonet, your, your thoughts on the subject. Yeah, for me to stay ahead, a company will be able to, to manage its data, uh, collect it as we saw, uh, organize it, uh, protect it, mm -hmm. uh, store it, uh, being able to give sense to the data. Uh, we'll talk later about smart data. And uh, this, as I said, it concerns everyone in the company. So that will be a new way of working in a company and a new way of training everyone at every level of the company. And that will be a huge effort. Uh, you, uh, between you and Dr. Jean, you both reference new ways of, of working and, and it goes beyond just the software. And that's, that really ties into the next key area, which is the workforce of the future. After all, that's key to helping facilitate the change. So why don't we explore that topic a little bit further. Uh, I want to read for you a statistic that we learned this week from uh, the World Economic Forum. Uh, in their future jobs report, they stated that uh, approximately uh, 75 million jobs that are currently existing today could be automated with the evolution that's taking place. But 133 million jobs or roles would be created so that bodes the question about how do we support this new workforce and what do we do to enable that workforce. Uh, Dr. Grease, we'll start with you first. What types of jobs do we expect to see in the future? And what are some of the skill set changes that we need to look at to ac account for these new types of jobs and roles? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great question. And the answer is nobody knows. Uh, but let me sort of directionally point you kind of to where I think that, that we need to do. And I think that there's a couple of pieces. One is, is that um, we need to train uh, and really educate 21st century students for 21st century jobs with 21st century methods. And in point of fact, I think we, we fall short of that. So we need to incorporate the technologies that, that these people coming into the workforce uh, have grown up with. And one of the objections I get is, well, gee, uh, you know, the Dassault suite of products is too complicated. I can't put it in my curriculum because I don't have the time to train it. And I said, who trained them on Call of Duty last weekend, okay? I mean, they learn that instinctively, so we really don't need to, to do that. The second thing I think is, is that we're going to, to, to stop looking at process stuff in terms of do this, do this, do this, and you get the outcome. We need to train people into not knowing what to do but why they're doing it. And so the education aspect of it uh, needs to focus. I also think we need to be a little more uh, um, multidisciplinary. So learning a lot about a little is, I don't think, where the, where the future is going. Um, I mean, there's the, the, the AI and things coming on are going to affect rogue jobs. I mean, if you basically are a rogue job, you're in danger of losing that. So we're going to have to have people that basically are creative, innovative, uh, can work in teams, and basically can augment their capabilities with the technologies that they've grown up with. Okay. Professor Champonet, your viewpoint. Yeah, um, I think that one key point is, is the, the training of engineers, the next generation of engineers. Okay. Um, they will be able to enrich their culture with uh, uh, digitalized uh, information coming from, from the history of the, of the company. Uh, they will be able to rely on, on real-time uh, digital information. And uh, they will have to make decision based on, on the combination of, uh, of uh, digital information coming from simulation, from military information, and, and for their, their, their digitalized culture. And to be able to, to be performance, to, to take the right decision, as we saw earlier, they must, re they must know um, the, um, the representativeness of the data they will, use of they will use for that. And so they will need uh, smart data uh, to be a smart engineer and performant engineer. Okay. So if, if we take you know, this construct and, and apply it, the workforce of the future is uniquely different. And I'll come back to you, Dr. Greaves, is 
you know, how do the skills align to this next generation of workers? Uh, you referenced it with the, the gaming concept, but essentially, you know, these workers, they learn differently, right? They live differently. They use different tools. They're, they're, they understand things differently. And not only that, they interact differently using the technology. So uh, can you share with you know, your insights on how uh, academics can help apply you know, and take advantage of the new works and, and appeal to that um, so that manufacturers can then benefit? Yeah, so, so I mean, that's a, an interesting question. And I, and I think the thing is, is that in, in some cases, um, so, so I'll, I'll basically uh, um, take a little bit of, of issue, is I don't think we train engineers. I think we educate engineers. And I think we've got to teach them, you know, why they're doing things and not simply what they do. And a lot of the educational aspect is here are the formulas, apply them. But, but we have gotten away from, from teaching critical thinking skills and, and basically um, the idea of really digging in as to what root causes are. Uh, and, and I think that, that we've also, you know, spent a lot of time in terms of having them memorize things. And quite frankly, you can look it up, you know what I mean? I mean, the ability of having to know that. Now, I'm not proposing that we black box things. The students really need to know what to do. But I'm not very popular in math departments because I, I say, you know, how many differential equations do you have to solve to know what a differential equation is. A and I think that we sort of need to integrate that into the engineering programs. A and I'd get rid of math departments personally, but, but I think, <laughs> that, uh, um, I think that, that we really need to, to have those kind of capabilities. Now, math in the past has been to teach critical thinking skills, but I think we can do that in terms of product development. Innovation is, is key. If we're not being innovative in the future, um, the, the workers of the of future won't have jobs. So, so we really got to focus on the innovation piece. Okay. Professor Jung, how do you think about rethinking academics to support the workforce of the future? Yeah, I, I think uh, we, you know, we, we just have a very uh, large skill discussion on the, the future education, especially for the engineer education. I think we agree, we, we not train the, the students, we educate the students. So. Uh, 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 we have a fundamental transformation from uh, is from uh, knowledge base to the competence base. So you know we have uh, so many knowledge in the mechanical engineering, in the electronic engineering, mm -hmm. in the computer engineering. With so many different knowledges, the students cannot use three, four years on the graduate program for years to learn all the knowledges. But if you look at the real world problem, most of the problem is uh, multidisciplinary. You cannot only use a small set of uh, knowledge to solve it. You need a different knowledge to solve it. And also, you will find knowledge generated rapidly. Maybe today you have some knowledge, but uh, when you go to the job, you find the job, and you find the knowledge is totally different. So that means you need the competence instead of knowledge. So this is a very fundamental transformation for our uh, university. So if you look at the course, we don't, need, we don't ask the systematic way to organize the knowledge points, but we try to organize based on the competence. So several competences we, we, uh, we, we focus on. The first one, yeah, ac actually, 30 years ago, I think the information literature is so many important, it's so important. So while I was a student, I'm majoring in the, the mechanical engineering, but I still take a course in the computer science or information technology, mm -hmm. because the university thing is very important. And then we, uh, we, we, we say the problem solving is a competence. It's very important, so in our, uh, uh, in our university, we have the, we call the SRT program. Student research training program. So for our undergrad students, we add them in their very early stage. They can meet the real world problem. They can join, engage in the research work led by the professor. So they are not the learn the knowledge. They need to learn by themselves. Maybe not knowledge in, in the course, but they have to solve a problem. They need some new knowledge. They can learn by themselves. So this is the one. We, we, in Tsinghua, we are very strong in that, so we put lots of efforts in that area. 
The second one is uh, innovation, creativity. Creativity. It's also very important. To company. You know, automation make uh, the repetitive work disappear. You know, if if you are the worker in the workshop, uh, your work is a represent re repetitive work. Maybe after two or three years, robots will replace your job. But innovative job will not uh, disappear. The computer cannot do the innovative job. So that's why at Qinghua, we have what we call the make cent uh, eye center. It's innovation center. We send our students, no matter you major in the engineer, humanity, even the law school, you can have some idea designed by like Katia software, and also you can use the uh, you know, 3D printing, maybe the machine to, to, to realize your idea. So we, we have the very big innovation center. We give the facility to support the students have some innovative uh, idea. This, the, the second one we call the global competence. I think you, because of information technology, we have to work with each other. We have to collaborate with uh, all, among, all around the world. So we ask our students, can, uh, it's used to work with the foreign engineer to work globally. So this uh, uh, is the basic chance from my departments. The systematic mindset is our focus because systematic is, uh, mindset is so important. If you look at the grand challenge, less uh, in, in the newspaper, it's all the system. It's a complex system, like climate, pollution. You cannot use one or two professors or one or two disciplines to solve it. You need the, the, the multidiscipline, maybe the interdisciplinary knowledge, the professor from different disciplines to work together to solve it. So the system mindset is so important. So this is just uh, our thinking. So we will implement it in our education system. Yeah, very comprehensive. Yeah. Very comprehensive. Uh, Professor Champonet, very specifically, there's an interesting uh, uh, transformation taking place at NSAM. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can shed some light on how you're adapting and supporting that and what you can do with manufacturers to attract the workforce there. Yeah. Uh, you know, in, in education during the last years, we invest a lot in, in the virtual world. And uh, the next challenge is to train the, the students at the same time on the virtual world and the real one, as we saw uh, earlier. And that's a major challenge for, for us because many uh, universities or schools, uh, uh, when they had lack of money, they get rid of, of the real systems. And now they have to reinvest in that. In, in my institution that was created in the, in the 18th century, we have always kept some uh, industrial level uh, training uh, platforms, technological platforms. Okay. So I think today, uh, curiously, we are ahead because we have both platforms and we just have to bring uh, the virtuality on this platform. And that I think that would, be, that would be easier for us to train the students uh, to at the same time to use both uh, virtual world and real world to take the, the correct decision at the correct time. Yeah, very interesting. Very so interesting uh, perspectives from uh, three different parts of the world and looking at, at how to address uh, the, the, the workforce for the future. And if we look at the workforce of the future, uh, let's talk about some of the technologies and tools that come into place. Um, but also not looking at from a pure academic standpoint, but as many of you have referenced, working with companies, working with industry to solve some of these problems. So maybe, uh, Dr. Greaves, you'd like to provide an example of where uh, working in the university uh, with students and business together, uh, helping solve some of the problems as well as train uh, and give these, these students the experiences and knowledge and know-how that they're looking for. So, so, so I think there's a, there's a couple of pieces here sort of looking at the, at the technologies. One is, is that, that sort of, we haven't talked about virtual reality, but in terms of the design phase, I think we're gonna see a lot of virtual reality being done as people take it through the whole product life cycle. So, so you, you know, in the past, sometimes the engineering has, oh, we designed the product, we throw it over the wall, and we're done with it. I think this idea of virtual reality is to basically be able to take it, not only design the product, manufacture the product, and see how the product is, is supported. I think then the, the augmented reality comes into play when we start to do manufacturing. And one of the things that we haven't sort of talked about 
is, in fact, I've got a chapter coming out about it, is we talked about the digital twin, but we really need the physical twin, which is the smart connected product that's going to feed the data into the digital twin to be able to do that. And so that's a whole different set of, of, of skills and capabilities. But, uh, but back to the multi-domain aspect, so the, the project that we had was with, a, with an aerospace company who, who we did a multi-domain optimization on a fuel system, and it was a mixture of employees from this company and students. And when they did the presentation, you couldn't tell who was a student and who was the employee. And the great news for the students was they all got hired after that by the company <laughs> because they basically picked up the software and were able to do um, um, heat, uh, fuel, uh, uh, hydraulics, and electric in, in this multi-domain thing. So, so the point about, you know, we teach, we've been teaching students a lot about a little. I think we have to be, be, be much more broader in terms of giving students exposure to multiple things. They'll be able to get the details of, of the lot piece from, from being able to do that on demand, but I think we need to expose them to this multi-domain so that they understand the various pieces, not only in the, in the, in the system itself, but across the life cycle, because it doesn't do you any good to produce a product that you can't manufacture and you can't support. And so, so looking at it from an entire product life cycle, I think is a key. In fact, my sec recommendation is we should send students through a PLM session as their freshman year to give them a flavor because we basically say, pick an area of discipline, you know, as a freshman, and they're sort of clueless. And I think we need to give them exposure to the entire product life cycle so they can make an informed decision about the areas they want to be in. Okay. Yeah, very interesting feedback. And, um, you know, the aerospace company, I, I'm, I'm sure it's one of the ones that uh, you can't elaborate too much on because it's an aerospace company and the confidentiality around that. And I fully understand that. That is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> can't tell you who it is. I'd have to um, kill you. <laughs> uh, Professor Champagnet, maybe you could shed some examples on where your students are working with industry. Uh, yeah. Um, as I said before, we need to train our, our students by mixing uh, virtual world mm -hmm. and real world. And, and uh, uh, as you can see on, on the picture over there, and uh, that's why we, we have chosen to work with, with Desktop System and use the 3D experience uh, uh, platform uh, for its uh, versatility, adaptability, but also uh, the fact that it covers, as it was said, the, the whole uh, the entire life cycle of, of the product. So um, by by next uh, by next year, uh, all of our students and all of our academics will have their personal access to a 3D experience platform. Uh, that's uh, more than 6,000 uh, person in, wow. in in a school, and uh, uh, we do that because that will enhance the training, but that will also enhance the collaboration between the students, between the students and the faculties, and also between the students and the companies outside the school. And that's something that is very important to bring the companies inside the school through the 3D experience platform. And um, uh, we will also encourage us, the students to use the platform for their, their, their student life. You know, they organize uh, huge galas, use charities, uh, they build sets, they, they, have, they do a lot of work outside the courses, and we want them to use the platform during that work. Yeah, very interesting. It's, it's very clear that looking at the workforce of the future in education is, is taking a much, you know, looking at it not only the new skill sets, but looking at it holistically and doing it interactively in these complex uh, areas so that you can have companies working with students in a multiple disciplinary fashion so that we can really uh, enable this workforce of the future. Uh, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the changes that are affecting organizations as they go through this transformation. Uh, many companies that are looking to transform manufacturing are, are doing it different ways. Uh, some companies are spinning off divisions as individual startups. And, and creating a firewall between them and the rest of the company because they can then start with a clean slate. Other companies are, are doing what's called skunkworks projects. Other companies are doing um, you know, pure cross-functional teaming within their current infrastructure. You know, each one of these different types of approaches has its pros and its cons. Maybe uh, based upon the work that you're all doing and the experience with the companies that you're working with, 
you shed some insight on the ecosystems that they're creating and you know what are the factors that you see in these initiatives that allow companies to be successful when they pursue them and I think the audience would be uh, be interested to hear that because there's so many different approaches um, Dr. Greaves would you like to start yeah so so it's an interesting problem and and one of the 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 major problems is that all this change is about culture and and sometimes and a lot of times putting startups into large corporations the bureaucracy will overwhelm this the startup companies and so so and I've worked in big companies and I've started a bunch of small companies and and really if you're really going to make these things work they have to be sort of outside the 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 framework of the major corporation or else they'll basically get bogged down in, into bureaucracy. So I'm, so I'm sort of, I, I, I rarely see where a big company will have a startup inside it, and when they send them to HR and to legal, and by the way, I wouldn't put a lawyer on any of my teams, um, but, but uh, um, you know, all of a sudden, they're basically spending more time on that than they are on innovation. So, so I think that, that the, the model that I would do is you set up the company outside of the organization, and do that. Procter & Gamble has been very successful in terms of, of not necessarily doing that, but picking companies that they thought had good possibilities and then partnering with them and even buying them later on. So, so the, the key thing is you have to have compatibility across the various aspects. So the organization, the culture, the technology. And, you know, my saying is that, you know, people trump technology, you know, coming out of the the, the old the systems business, computer business, is the, uh, is the dumbest person can outwit the smartest computer every day of the week. And so you got to make sure that, that you have this capability and, co and, and compatibility across that organization. I think that's the biggest important thing. If you have a mismatch in, in any one of these areas, you're going to be unsuccessful. If you have a very uh, process-oriented organization trying to run an innovative organization, it, they're going to die, okay? And so, so you better have, have an understanding of what the compatibility across these three areas are. Okay. Um, Professor Champonet, you have some interesting thoughts on this. Yeah, for me, the, the new ecosystems, but also includes startups and students. Uh, you see, we see a new trend in France where companies who used to have their innov innovation labs inside a company, they want to tra transplant it into the universities uh, so that they can work with uh, startups and with students on the project. We have one example in, a, in, in my institution where a very well-known uh, te telecommunication company in France who wants to uh, work on the next generation of wi wireless communication for the industry, they will bring some of their engineers and some of their technology into the university and to have to propose this technology to startups and to students' project, mm -hmm. so the, the, the whole ecosystem can move faster. Yeah, very interesting. Professor Chun, what are you seeing? Yeah, I, I think we already, we have observed, you know, the, the paradigm transformation. Um, you know, now in China, the government really encouraged the, the staff, the small company, and they have lots of, they build lots of incubates or innovation park. Even uh, in Qinghua, we have a three-year, uh, we call it innovation zoom. So we really encourage our students to have some idea, then, then have a, some staff company, very small company, and the, uh, the, the university gives some funding to support them. And uh, on the other hand, in our big company, like the hair, they, uh, they, they reorganize their uh, product development department. They, they, they organize, uh, originally they just have a big department, now they say, okay, every engineer like a small company. So every time they just uh, give a non-call for proposal, they ask all this engineer like a small company to, to, to write a proposal to say, I, I can do that, and how many money we need. So you will find that the, 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 the I already find some transformation. So I, I'm not sure. Maybe in the future, because of information technology, I think the collaboration, cooperation capability is so important. Maybe the company will have different idea to use this uh, information technology to enhance 
the different type of uh, collaboration and uh, cooperation capability. Yeah. Okay. Well, let, so me just, let me just add one other thing is that, go that ahead, uh, the idea of using students, I think, is really interesting because students don't know things are impossible. And so they come up with solutions that, that everybody says you can't do it, the, the, uh, the standard answer. And they don't know it's impossible. I mean, they don't think that gravity really is the thing uh, <laughs> that's going to rule the universe. And so, so they can come up with, it with really innovative ideas because they haven't, haven't sort of been structured. So this idea of moving it out of the organization and into a university, maybe, maybe not fully there, but, but getting the students involved, I think it's a great thing for the students, and I think it's a great thing for the organizations. No, I, I completely agree, and, and that kind of leads to the next area of this. If we talk about establishing new ecosystems, whether it's a startup or maybe it's an established company that has an existing supply chain, you know, the business is evolving and changing to value networks. And obviously there are differences between the startup's value network that they're creating versus the traditional company that has a supply chain evolving to a value network. Um, a question to, to you, Dr. Greaves, would be if you you know, working with the different companies that you work with, what are you seeing with regards to um, the trends of these traditional supply chains as they evolve to value networks? So, so, so what's getting interesting is in a lot of cases, there are more people outside of an organization working with the product than inside the organization. And so, so the supply network is really an important aspect. Part of the problem, though, is that we can't have it based on moving physical products around. So the idea of supply chain, where basically I don't know what's going to show up in my loading dock until it's there, is problematic. And so, so sort of my corollary for the digital twin is what I call a supply network, which is basically you know, transmit the data about the product well in advance. So, you, so instead of dealing sort of with physical objects, we're dealing with the information about products so you know well in advance that the product is being made and made to your specifications before it ever shows up. So, yeah. so the new kind of slogan is transmit me your digital twin and I'll tell you whether to send me the physical product. And so, so really this whole idea of, of having information about the suppliers and what they're doing I think can basically help them not only do a better product for companies, but also prevent sort of the mismatch by this is what I think I'm producing for you, and this is what shows up that's that's unacceptable. And so, so I think this whole this that that, that the, the way we've talked about digital twins uh, with the physical products, we need to talk about supply networks, which is the movement of information that that basically corresponds to supply nets, which is about moving and logistics and physical products. Yeah, or maybe stated a little differently, having the digital twin representation of the entire network of suppliers and being able to share that information so that they can make decisions before actual movement of products and goods. Interesting concept. Professor Jun, what do you see with the, the evolution of supply chains and the companies that you're working with? Yeah, I, uh, actually, I, I don't know what's the future of the value network, but I know that, uh, I'm sure that uh, the information network, I think, will increase rapidly and we have more and more data, and uh, we have really uh, very high uh, level of transparency of the workshop, and uh, it's really uh, uh, make the people feel closer, not uh, no matter job, you know where you mm -hmm. are. So I think uh, it's basically I think it will affect uh, the people work together. If we change the basic way the people work together. I don't know what's the future of the uh, value network. I don't know how the value will create or generate it. I don't know, but I think in the future we will have the more different way. I mean, the network, will, the, the, the shape of the paradigm will different. Okay. Do you see advantages between startups versus global companies. So for example, uh, Dr. Greaves, we were talking about the value network. Is there, do the global companies have a, an advantage over the innovators or vice versa? Well, I mean, if you look at sort of the, the statistics, global companies spend more money in R&D, have more money to spend in R&D than small organizations. So, so the, the issue of it is, is that, that the funding does dictate a lot of that. And we're seeing, you know, the China 2025, Industry 4.0, uh, 
the network, uh, National Network of Manufacturing Innovation in the United States as kind of ways to help the small to medium enterprise be able to, to do that. So if we're going to have innovation out of the SMEs, small uh, manufacturing enterprises, we're going to have to assist that because, quite frankly, the resources for the, for the kind of innovation and complex products that we're seeing it is problematic for the small companies. Makes sense. Professor Champagnet, you, your viewpoint. Yeah, one small answer. One main advantage of the global company is that it will be able to protect its data within yeah. its ecosystem. Yeah, that's a very important point. Data if data is the new oil, mm -hmm. is protecting that exactly. information. Professor Jun? I I don't think the we 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 say the future, we all the big company all we will all the, the, the stop small company. They all their own position. But uh, from my viewpoint, maybe in the future, the startups, the small companies have more value than the, the big company. Okay. One last question. Uh, with the evolution and changes of the value networks, how do you see it impacting the products and services that companies make? Um, Dr. Greaves, we'll start with you. So, so one thing people have to remember is nobody wants your product, okay? Um, they want what your product does. Nobody wants a drill or a steam shovel. They want a hole. And so, so too often we get so enamored with the, the product itself, we forget about the fact that customers really don't want your product, they want what it does. So we're seeing new models for companies that understand that. So selling power by the hour on, uh, on airplane engines or basically having product as a service. So I think that, that you know, we now have sort of the ability, especially with having information about the product, to have much more information to do things predictively. So, so we're moving from a reactive world to a predictive world. And so if I have information to be able to predict, for example, um, if I see this and this and this, I'm going to have this problem, I can basically move from periodic maintenance to basically proactive maintenance based on that. Mm -hmm. And whoever has that information will basically be able to do that. So, so I think that we're going to see product as a service, service as a product, all those different things. But you've got to get out of your mind that people want your product. They want what your product does. Yeah, very true. Professor Champenet. Yeah, for me, one major thing is the direct link that we will have between uh, the customer and the company while the customer experiences the product uh, due to IoT uh, and so on. So I this will change, this direct link will change the way we design, the way we create, the way we maintain. And, and this also increases the social responsibility of the company mm. will, will have a direct view on the use of the product uh, at, at the customer. Okay. Dr. Zhu? Yeah. yeah, I think in the future, the, the, the people engaging in the service industry will much more than engage in the you know, product area. So I think, but currently we don't have, a, you know, for the products, we have enough capability, like the software, how to design the products. We have the ERP system, how to produce the, the products. But for the service, actually, we don't have enough software to, to, to design the service or to operate the service. So we need lots of uh, work to do. So we, then we can change from uh, 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 product to the service industry, yeah. yeah. Uh, Nice summation. Uh, again, I want to thank you all for your time today. Uh, a lot of insight, a uh, very interesting perspective. And we'll spend just one minute to recap. If you listen to today's panel discussion, I think there were a few takeaways. Uh, first is embrace these trends. Uh, these are opportunities to transform uh, the companies and transform the approach to go to market, new ways of producing, new ways of innovation, and new ways of going to market to create new customers. To do that, one of the key elements is to ensure and understand the organization, understand its maturity, understand the culture, understand the technology and the supporting capabilities. And as I plan forward, ensure that you have the, the technology and platform to support this change and transformation. And then last, it all has an impact on the workforce of the future. Not only is it dealing with and supporting the, the jobs of today, but planning and establishing the, the, the foundation for the workforce of the future with the future skills, but it comes back to part of the discussion we had with regards to uh, the academics is working differently, training differently, and focusing on those 
uh, new skills that have to be developed, whether it's complex problem solving, critical thinking, uh, collaboration, while at the same time leveraging the, the, the solutions and tools and technology they, and working with industry. Uh, so with that, I think it's, it's a phenomenal time. Uh, you have confirmed that we're in the industry renaissance. I think and look at you here as, as the panel is, as leaders in that space, and we collectively in this room, I think we have the opportunity to help transform manufacturing. So it's upon us to be change agents to do that in our respective areas. So thank you for your time. Guillaume, I'll turn it back over to you.